everyone. Thanks for joining this breakout session today. You are in for a real treat. We're going to be covering Plant Forward lessons from across Asia. We have two incredible chef demonstrations. Um, this is a breakout session sponsored by Unilever Food Solutions. So wanted to uh, introduce Rudy Smith, who's the corporate chef, just to give a few opening remarks. Thank you, Allison. Hello. First, on behalf of Unilever Food Solutions, I'd like to welcome you all to this session. I'm very, very excited about this. I had the pleasure to join the CIA as we filmed the first edition of Inside the Plant Forward Kitchen, which you recently saw a uh, video clip of. And it was a great opportunity to meet some fantastic chefs. I was so impressed and inspired by the incredible ways California chefs are bringing vegetables to the center of the plate. One of the highlights for me personally was meeting Chef Hina. And, and I was just so delighted with her food and her approach to it. And even more than that, it was her stories of how her childhood and her family influenced her cooking and how she brings those flavors of her childhood to life in her restaurant and for her guests. I'm very excited to hear more of her story and how the global flavors influence Plant Forward in our restaurants. Chef Hinnick and I worked together at the CIA at Hyde Park years ago. Uh, it was a great time. And I'm sure he will compliment the session in a similar way. And I look forward to hearing more about his story as well. So with that, I'll pass it back to Allison. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Chef Rudy. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Hina Patel, who's the chef and co-owner of Bashram, a vegetarian Gujarati restaurant in San Francisco's Dog Patch District. Roughly translated to mean shameless, Bashram features Hina's bold interpretation of the flavors and dishes that were prevalent throughout her childhood in India, playfully reimagined within a California context. Since the restaurant's opening in 2018, Hina has received local and national attention for her fearless style, including recognition as a James Beard Foundation Awards Best Chef, California semifinalist in 2022, and accolades from Eater San Francisco as the Restaurant of the Year in 2019. At Beshram, Hina offers an experience that is unmistakably hers while paying homage to her heritage and every chapter that has informed the journey to this moment. So please join me in welcoming Hina Patel. <laughs> Alison, that's such a nice intro. I have to remind myself what I achieved so far because every day grinding, you forget what it takes to reach there and thank you. And I, I'm enjoying each and every day. I pinch myself that having the restaurant, running the restaurant is so chaotic, but I love, I love that life. I love that how much uh, I share my favorite food who walks into my restaurant. So I can't wait all of you to come and join me one day. Uh, so Beisharam is the place where I celebrate the traditions that carried out by my grandmother, my mom, my sisters, my aunts. And uh, those are traditions are so, they do it without knowing that how uh, how rich they are, those red, how technique forward their everyday cooking is. And that's something I want to show you with very simple, humble uh, two recipes I'm going to share with you. But there is no, I never went to culinary school, when I, and I never grew up having the recipes in front of me. All I learned from trial and error. And that's the best school I had growing up. Uh, I want to show you the technique how to puff up the bread every time. And my mom had a rolling pin. Whenever the puri doesn't puff up, she used to smack the head. <laughs> <laughs> but that teach me very quickly how in a five strokes, I make my puri and it has to puff up. So. I want to share with you a little bit, little, um, if you do it at home, how you get the perfect puris. We, I'm going to start with my dough. Very quickly, I want to show you. This is the whole wheat flour. 
And today I'm going to, of course, using Kensington yellow mustard in my puris. And that's that. I'm going to use a spoon. This puris with the mustard, uh, turmeric, chili, sesame. We have that with a cup of chai in the morning. This is the bread I grow up with. And you can use the chili as much as you like or as little as you like. This is asafoetida. This is the must ingredient. It's very pungent, very to the nose, but amazing flavor just with a pinch of it. So never skip if you know, if you find for your puris. This one is semolina. Semolina, if I have uh, four cups of flour, semolina you use like two tablespoons only, but that will keep, that's one of the secret, keep your puris puffed longer. So when you fry before your guests arrive, still they look puffed and ready to go. I think I got everything in here. After having the restaurant, uh, I had to learn myself to write the recipes. Because we all never measure anything. I always by touch, by texture, and I, my culinary life started almost 10 years ago. I joined La Cocina as an incubation, and they said, we don't need to teach you how to cook, you know that, but let me show you how to write the recipes. <laughs> so that I learned how after starting the incubation program. I will need a little more oil. Yeah. So one, when you do the puri dough, I think my recipe I asked. You need a firm, soft dough. And when you need to make your dough, this assemble the oil very well, and you need to form this without adding any water. When you have that kind of breadcrumb consistency, you know your oil incorporated very well. Don't ask me how much water, I will tell you how it is. <laughs> I don't think I can ever be a baker. But. I have a funny story. After my marriage, uh, my mother-in-law asked me to fry the puris so my father-in-law can have hot puris. Uh, also, she was testing me, do I know how to make puris? <laughs> and oh my God, none of the puri puffed up, I felt. <laughs> it was so much pressure for me to perform, and so I, I felt so many times. But now, with those mistakes and failing, I kind of learned myself what to do right, I wish my mom would have told me or my mother-in-law would have said how to do it. They, they expect perfection, but they never taught me how to get there. I, I had to realize on my own. I know we have only half hour. I'm trying very fast. What I wanted to show you, uh, it may took like 16 ounce, maybe close to one to three quarter cup of the water. But your dough is firm. 
is not sticking to my hand. You want that. And this is where you apply your pressure. It's very different uh, than our baking uh, cookies where you don't need the dough as much. But telling you, Puri loves pampering. So you had to put your muscles and you had to knead it. comes together. We just added the chili, the turmeric, the asafoetida, sesame, salt. Now we have to let this dough rest. If you do straight away, it's not going to work. You have to mingle all those flavors so you're not able to see the chili, the turmeric, sesame. It becomes all one. And that resting is the key. You can rest up to two hours or minimum half hour. So very tight. And the salt will dissolve the turmeric, almost kind of cook. And it's so surprising how this yellow mustard brings also the flavor in the dough. And now we're going to rest this. I'm going to quickly wash it. I love Rebecca. She's like giving me the towel there. <laughs> I prepared this two hours ago just to make sure that we are ready in our minimum time today. This rolling pin, I bring, my mom gave it to me when I left my home. And over the years, it has been cracked, but I take it everywhere. All my bread, I use this rolling pin. You can buy easily the rolling pins on Amazon for 2 to $3, but mine has a so much emotional attachment to it. There is a technique of rolling this. So I like the one, um, I can put my palm here, palm here, and that allows the even pressure. And this is one to know. So you go here and you kind of roll, and your dough will go by circle itself. You don't need to touch your puri. And even pressure brings the evenness in your puri, and it's freaking so important. So like if you see that, there is evenness on each side. I will do one more in case if that doesn't puff up, my backup. As a child, I mesmerized when my mom's roti go round and round. It's like, how she does that? The simple thing makes me a little bit more curious. Is our temperature rich? I, our, I use any vegetable oil. Uh, I like canola, sunflower, peanut, any kind of vegetable except olive oil. So you have to have the oil that can allow to have a higher smoking point. Um, I'm not, should we use canola? Mm -hmm. So this is our canola oil today. 385 to 400 Fahrenheit is the good temperature. What my mom showed me, can I have a little bit? We never had a, but she said if you put the little bit of dough and it should come up straight away. It took a second to come up, so we had to wait. A little bit more hot, Rebecca. I'm going to do it. For my cuisine, um, raita, pickle, chutneys, those are the, our condiment we always have in our pantry or in our fridge. And that's where we dip our bread. 
at my restaurant, I do have seven, eight different types of pickles and chutneys. I'm gonna try it out, maybe a little bit more hot. That puffs up. And you let it stay till one more minute to kind of have a little deep brown color. So this is our thinner and the bottom is more thicker. And you have to let, have a pressure a little bit so the puri gets cooked at the bottom evenly. I don't know about you, but I'm so proud of myself right now. <laughs> so I told you two or three different types to make this puri. How big, how small, it doesn't matter. Every time it will puff up. The first thing, you ha your dough should not be too much water in it. You have to rest your dough, that's the second. And third thing, when you roll it, it has to be even. One side thick, one side thin, then it won't work. So those are the three little things and your temperature has to be close to 400 Fahrenheit, and you will get the perfect result every time. Quickly, I want to show you the raita recipe. I love, we're going into the hot season. The yogurt is every day we use in our cuisine, and cucumber raita is something cool you down on a hot days. So I have my Greek yogurt here. I have amazing team upstairs and they box great cucumber for me. And I love the skin, using the cucumber with the skin. You can use, I love two cucumber or more cucumber than the yogurt sometimes. This one is the salt, Rebecca. Right. Sure. When I use the salt. This is toasted cumin, black pepper. You know, coming here, um, mustard and the mayonnaise were the condiment. First time, I remember first time I had a coleslaw with the mayo and it's like, what is this? This is so yummy. Because, <laughs> and then I realized having that little touch of mayo in your raita adds more creaminess without adding the cream. And that something is very handy to know. I'm gonna fold our mayo, I think we have up to two tablespoons. Gonna slowly fold into our yogurt. And you let it sit in your refrigerator on day before you can prepare it. Now I want to show you how to bring live the sauce. And that's something uh, at my restaurant we do. Each and every dish that goes out, we tempered the sauces. And that technique, I want to show you how to do that. You can do on any sauce you make, the coconut sauce, the um, the green or the Thai sauce you make or any cuisine, doesn't matter. But having this tempering, in my Gujarati we say vagar, 
means you know that's the last thing you do before the dish goes out serving or bef because the fragrance and that everybody knows the dinner is ready. So we take the skillet or a small pan, we heat up the oil. Again, we're gonna use our canola oil. I think for this much amount of yogurt, we use, say, four tablespoons of the oil at the most. These are the black mustard seeds. We have whole cumin, asafoetida, and this one I'm showing you, of course, this is ginger raita. I love the ginger, the bite of the ginger with the creaminess of the cucumber uh, and the yogurt. And this one is the Fresno chili. I love spicy food, but if you don't, you can skip that. <laughs> and these are the curry leaves, limdo in Gujarati. And this is my favorite herb. It's very easy to find uh, right now. They are in the season. I also have the mint. You can chop the mint if you like, or if you want to have just because it's so much floral. I just put a little bit on top because I don't want to overpower our curry leaves. So I'm going to use just a little bit and we're going to put the hot oil on top so it will release the oil. So there is a technique to it. The mustard seeds needs to pop, and it requires, it has to go first. And then it's a second. We need to go cumin after mustard. We're going to go ginger last. We don't want to burn. So this is a tempering. We're doing it on a high temperature. We're flashing the ingredients to cook on a very quick manner. And that hot oil, we're going to pour over the cold yogurt. So be careful when you do it. But it's amazing how the ginger in a hot oil with the mustard and the cumin, it brings together. So mustard seeds needs to pop. Otherwise, it will give you a bitter taste. My mom done it. I used to go run in a different room because I was afraid, like, it's going to get fire. <laughs> Smoking? Mm. Yes. So it's just getting there. You can control the heat, take it off. That's our ginger raita, tempered with the mustard seeds, julienne. I use the very Thai tender ginger, who doesn't have a much fiber in it, so you can eat without chewing. Uh, and we have our asafoetida, whole cumin, curry leaves, mint, and that amazing bite when you dip your puri in it. Thank you all. Oh, beautiful. Amazing. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes if anyone has any questions that you would like to shout out to um, Hina while she's here. I know that you have to um, head back shortly after this wraps up today to go back to your restaurant, right? I do this every day. Yeah. I, I mean, 
Hi, this is fun. <laughs> Such incredible, oh my God, it smells so amazing up here too. Question. Even pressure on both sides. And uh, having a little um, flower for dusting, that will do if your dough is stiff but smooth, it's not sticky, it will roll. It will roll by itself with the even pressure. That was absolutely mesmerizing, right? Yeah. yeah. Question. Which, uh, which one? The puri? Was the puri. Was the dough cold or room temperature? Uh, room temperature. Room temperature dough. If you do it the day before, um, I say bring it to room temperature. Uh, it, it will work, but it will cool down your oil so fast, and it, it is hard. You do not want to put two or more than two or three at a time. I have a commercial fryer, I can go like 10 or 20, but it brings the temperature down, so you always do maximum four to five. Can you give everyone just a, a little snapshot of some of your other favorite dishes that are on your menu right now? Wow, the whole menu? The but, whole menu, obviously. <laughs> but I like to say dal dhokli. So dal dhokli, um, one of my favorite dish is one pot meal, and I serve, we do our hodo yubashis as my rotis, and the broth is uh, coconut and lime broth, mm. and I topped with the crunchy noodles I make at home. We have sweet potato fries, we have our uh, pickled onion <coughs> that goes on top, and uh, bok choy, cabbage, everything is fire smoke and I top it that, and you just put it all together and it's one pot meal. It's an amazing dish. Okay, so well, please I'm... join me in thanking Hina Chow. Thank you so much. <laughs>
It is delicious homemade soy milk for commercial purpose. If you're in the business of making money, don't make your own, own soy milk. It's a lot of work. You just can't charge enough money for this. And there are some really good products out there. It's just when, I, when we talked about this and the instructor who was in charge for this wasn't quite sure which brand to buy. And said, you know what? I'll make my own. It's fine. It's not a big deal. And then we have a coagulant for the soy milk. And what we have here is this magical powder. This is calcium sulfate. Oh, no, can the camera see this here? Uh, see, it says right here, calcium, that's the brand name. <laughs> so it's calcium sulfate. For those among us who are not quite sure what calcium sulfate is, it's gypsum. I know it sounds very weird, we put gypsum in our, in our food, but that's actually a main source of calcium in the diet of Chinese people. Most of them do not eat actually um, dairy products. And what the calcium sulfate does, it coagulates the proteins in, in the soy milk. Um, it doesn't thicken it. It's not. So I didn't go to Lois or Home Depot and took some drywall apart. This is actually food grade gypsum powder. Alternatives you can use for this, there is nigari, which is the Japanese counterpart, which is actually magnesium chloride. Just the same thing. Or you can buy a substance relatively new on the market for the last perhaps 10 years or so. It's called GDL, or gluconal delta lactone. And it works really well, gives you a very, very smooth gel. The problem only is it has to be used in such minute amounts. We're talking about 0.0% relative to the soy milk. You overdose very quick unless you have a little drug dealer scale. So gypsum is, is about double, double the, the amount. It's about 0.6%. That's a little easier to dose. And what I have here, um, Rebecca was kind enough to prepare this for me. I have a little water and I have my gypsum powder. And this just goes into a bowl. And we prepare a little slurry. We prepare a little slurry of the gypsum powder. Now, you don't want to let this sit too long because, trust me, you get a piece of drywall in this bowl. You don't want this. So just mix it together. And the soy milk is hot. Now, there's two ways to go about this. You can either pour the hot soy milk on there and let it sit for about 20 minutes, so it should be done within, this, within the time of this demo, or you can pour the cold soy milk on it and then just steam it, and you will have the same thing. So the, the coagulation will be activated by, uh, by, um, also by, by the heat. Um, when I do this at home for my wife and myself, do this often enough for breakfast, um, I commonly make individual bowls and put some gyps in the bowl, pour the soy milk on top, and then steam those two bowls. And, uh, but again, on a commercial basis, it is easier and more efficient to do it this way. So the soy milk is almost at a boil. Be careful if you boil the soy milk. It, is, it scorches so easily. If you think milk scorches easily, holy crap, soy milk. <laughs> so we're almost... And I've often been asked if I couldn't use... Uh, vinegar or some acid to coagulate the soy milk. And yes, you can, and regular vinegar will coagulate soy milk just fine. The problem only is what then happens is it's going to be very curdly, almost like an egg drop soup. And that will be a complete different uh, dish, actually. It's very popular in, in Taiwan, what they call the xian dou jiang, which means salty soy milk. And it has the texture of an egg drop soup, very curdly. Our goal here is to make a smooth gel almost like a very, very tender uh, creme brulee, creme caramel flan. That is, that is our objective here. Sometimes people ask me if we couldn't use gelatin or agar agar, the vegan counterpart, and that gives you a very bouncy gel, which is just not right, doesn't seem right. So soy milk is almost hot, comes to a boil, all right, and it goes right on there. Now start slowly, just pour it on there. And this alone will do the trick that the gypsum gets mixed in properly. If I do this at home, I like to put a towel on top. You can use plastic wrap. The problem only with plastic is it's going to start sweating. And then all the water drops onto the, onto the gel, which is not something you want. That sits here now. Now we can keep on going. So again, the... There's two basic approaches, sweet, uh, sweet uh, topping and salty and savory topping. I'll do, I'll do both, 
and you'll have a chance to actually taste this for breakfast tomorrow. I'll, I'll have it ready for breakfast tomorrow. I'll start off doing the sweet topping first, which is a simple syrup flavored with ginger. Now, you can be, of course, very flexible. If you like it with, um, if you like some anise flavor in there, feel free, feel free. Uh, there's no, no, no wrong, no wrong or right. Then we have our sugar right here, equal parts of sugar and water. And we just bring it to a boil and add the ginger. Very finely minced ginger. Some chefs will tell you you have to cut the ginger into strips. Thank you. Have to cut the so nice, right? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I'm normally on Rebecca's side. So I, I, I love this. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, uh, some chefs will say you have to cut the ginger into strips, and that's a matter of personal preferences. Ginger can be very, very chewy. Some people enjoy that very much. I'm not the biggest friend of this, so I take the liberty of mincing the ginger very, very finely. Um, my wife, who is Chinese, uh, tends to agree with me in this case. I guess that's one of the very few things she agrees with me. <laughs> Love my wife. She's the best wife in the whole world, trust me. She helped me to develop those recipes here. And, oh my God, my wife and I just can't cook together. <laughs> <laughs> just cannot. No, you can't edit now, later. So, yeah, okay, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I will not argue with you. Love her to pieces. Even though her sister, when she came to visit us in the U.S., her sister <laughs> told me uh, that she likes my Chinese food more than my wife's Chinese food. <laughs> She's just being polite. <laughs> I got to hear that. So, as you can see, I'm a blessed man. So, as it comes to ball, a few words. Uh, uh, what else we're going to serve with this? I have right here. You can buy those commercially. These are call them Chinese crawler. If you in Chinese, they call yuchar, which means oil stick. Doesn't sound very appetizing, right? It's like a fried dough. It's commonly leavened with a mixture of baking powder, baking soda, and uh, ammonium bicarbonate, also known as potash, you have a little nosy aftertaste, and these come frozen, and we'll just pop them in the oven later on. In the ideal world, you make them fresh. Again, you might not have the resources to, to make them fresh. Um, also, perhaps interesting to understand, uh, depending on where you are in China, if you're somewhere in the south, if you're somewhere in the south, you'll uh, find on the menu what I call this dohua, which means bean flour, and that is this very tender tofu with a sweet topping. If you're in the north somewhere, you'll find on the menus, which is called tofu now, which, which means tofu brain or bean curd brain. <laughs> so if you don't know much about the Chinese culture, but you, are, you can read the language, you'll leave some oil stick with bean curd brain. <laughs> I don't know if I want to order that, right? <laughs> so and that's... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I personally, I'm a big, big friend of the, of the savory topping. But tomorrow morning, I'll have the, the uh, soft toy, soy pudding ready for you guys, and then you can pick or choose which topping you want. You can, come back, you can come back for seconds. So for this one, I just bring this to a boil till it's clear. And that's fine. This is very simple syrup making. I have some lemon juice right here. That's for balance. And the, but the lemon juice I put in the very last moment. If you would like this to be lime juice, by all means just some acid for, for balance, so it's not so monochromatically sweet. And this ginger syrup can be made days in advance, so if you want to do this in a, in a commercial setting, this doesn't need to be made fresh every day, it's actually very nice when it's cold or at room temperature on the hot, on the hot tofu pudding. So it doesn't have to make, be made warm at all. All right, so as this slowly happens, I'm running out of stuff to talk about here. I'm going to preheat the, the skillet, do a little multitasking here. I'm going to go on a, on a relative low heat. And I start off, I will talk about the savory topping, what goes on there. And the savory topping is, as the conference suggests, it's primarily plant. If you go to China, especially Beijing, Tianjin, somewhere in the northern areas, and you, you, you order this, you get, it's often called like a Beijing style gravy. For me, it's not really gravy. It's like a saucy stir fry. And you will find in there what we have here. These are woodier mushrooms. And these are just phenomenal mushrooms. Very, very common in, in North Chinese cuisine. And they have, can the camera capture this? There you go. And they are just, they come dried normally. 
and they grow like ears on decaying wood, hence the name, woody or mushrooms. They are not famous for their flavor, they are famous for their texture. They give a very, very unique crunch. Then, they, this is how they, how they look like, the camera catches when, they, when they're dry. Then, what, goes, what also goes on there is lily, dried lily buds. These are the actual flower buds of a lily. If you travel around the area in Shanghai, you will see them, you will see these flowers grow all over the place. They grow like beets all over the place. These are the dried flower buds. And Rebecca was kind enough to soak them and cut them for me. Then we have other things, the regular ginger, we have scallions. My wife insisted, no garlic. Okay, yes ma'am, no garlic. <laughs> even though I personally like garlic in there, but that's, that's okay. We have, in this case, shrimp. You can use chicken, you can use pork, you can use no meat at all. If you order this somewhere in China, you're lucky if you get like two or three little bits or pieces of ground pork, because they have primarily a lot more vegetables in there. Then we have one of my favorite chili paste right here, and uh, it's a relatively novelty in China, maybe for 10, 20 years. And that's something that you would refer to as chili oil. And this particular brand is called La, La Ganma. It's one of my favorite chili pastes. Very aromatic, not spicy at all. Just a little spicy. And then, and then aromatics, we have the, the, the usual uh, candidates. Soy sauce, dark soy sauce. We have some Shaoxing wine. If you have this, it's good doesn't have to be, and we have a little bit of the shrimp base, which is really good in this case, the, the, the Noor shrimp base, which goes really good with the, with the shrimp base. So, ginger, is, ginger syrup is clear, I just turned this baby off, can you all see this here? It's come to a boil, I now add my lemon juice, done. Rocket science here. <laughs> right, so, Let's just stop talking and go start cooking. So we have our, our oil, a few drops of water in there, that's okay. And we start off with the scallions, but as you can see, cut relatively large for texture. Then we have our ginger, and if you like some garlic in here, now would be the time. If you want to add some in there. I had to promise my wife not to put garlic. Yes, ma'am. One of the things, Hina, she, she has also very strong opinions about her food. She reminded me very much of my, of my wife. Very strong opinions. Then we have the, the uh, what's it called? The um, chili paste goes in here now. And I'll give the, the shrimp a quick sizzle, a quick stir fry. Don't want to cook it too long. Now, optionally, at this moment, you can say, hey, I, I don't want to overcook my shrimp. You could take the shrimp out now. Or you could start with the shrimp, stir fry them a little. I went back and forth on the recipe. I tried it several times with my wife. And I said, you know what? The shrimp are fine. Just leave them in there. And then we have, we have our uh, soy sauce. The dark soy sauce goes in there. We have our Shaoxing wine goes in there. And we're going to want to... Cook this down just a little bit. Do you have the water, pint of water? Between? Now I go on a, on a higher heat. In the meantime, as this happens, I'm going to make my, my cornstarch slurry. Because I want to thicken this whole thing later on. Awesome, thank you. So now I'm adding my woody mushrooms, I'm adding my, uh, my lily buds, and there's really no point in sweating those, we can just add our liquid right then and there. And then we have our seafood base goes right in there, and again, if you use chicken, use the chicken base, please. Sa same brand, I was, I was impressed, good product. All right, we bring the whole thing to a boil. It doesn't need to cook too long. Just bring it to a boil and you, you're pretty much done. And let me thicken it with some, this is phenomenal, I'm, oh my God. <laughs> Blown away. I want to do this more often. I'm sure my wife will bring me down again at home. <laughs> she 
she won't. She won't. She's actually bragging with the fact that I'm here. <laughs> All right, so bring, bring him to a boil. And we're taking it with a corn starch slurry. In the meantime, but once it comes to a boil, give it, give it a quick taste. Make sure everything is good. And you can, then, you, you, you can adjust to, to your liking. In the meantime, Want to get these ones? You want to get these ones hot? Then let's check our tofu. If everything went well, the one I made should have been done. I can I can bring this into the light. It might not be done yet because we didn't have that much time. Yeah, it's still very very soft. And perhaps you can see this because in anticipation of this to happen, it's like TV. <laughs> so you can see what a little. Can the camera catch this here? So this one is still very, very runny. It begins to, okay, but this one is almost like a gel. You see, you see the difference? Can the camera catch this? So we'll, we'll use the one we made half an hour before the demo started. So we got this one, yeah, it, so it takes, you can see if I go in there with this spoon, I don't know how well the camera can see that. So it is a gel, you see this here? But it's still very, very soft, whereas this one, it's still a very soft shell, but it maintains its shape much better. And that's just another 10 minutes. And I don't think you want to wait another 10 minutes. All right. My stir fry is coming to a boil. Mm. Oh, shit, it's good. All right. You watch my language here, huh? All right. Very simple, thickening little cornstarch slurry goes right in here. If you haven't measured the cornstarch, be careful, don't add it all at once, otherwise you have a little gel here, a pudding. We don't want that. We want this one to be at like a medium viscosity, as we, as we like to call it, like a medium nappe. So bring it to a boil. Mmm. So, what I use here is a skillet. If at home you want to use like a saucepan or a little pot, works just as good. All right, so you want to have, as you can see here, perhaps if I grab a spoon, the picture will capture this a little better. So you want to make sure it really coats the back of the spoon. Mm. To serve to serve this gel, again, you could, you could make each bowl individually with the right amount of gypsum and pour the salt milk on top. That is the best way, but only if you can charge 15 to 18 bucks for that, all right? Uh, in the meantime, if you don't have that option, a wok ladle works really well because you get it out in one scoop because you don't want to stir this too much. Too much agitation will break it apart and it looks like a broken curd. So you would go in here, in here, very, very gently with this relatively shallow ladle and go straight into your bowl. And you can see already here where the curds got cut, you have the first synergesis or the first separation of water. So you want to be careful. You don't want to agitate this too much. And that's why tomorrow for our breakfast, I will be there and serve that, make sure we don't break it all apart so badly. more. And then we have What do you think? I can do shrimp. You can do shrimp? Well, I'm glad I stopped. I'm glad you stopped. It smells delicious. <laughs> All right. But then let's that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Take a little more. Because I, I can't have you all come down and taste it, so maybe we can have a little witness here, see what Rebecca says. <laughs> right. Clean spoon. Take a bigger serving spoon. It's fresh soy milk. You like it? Good, I'm glad you do. So, we want to be relatively generous. And this, the stir-fry here, or the, the stew, is relatively salty. 
And that's for reason because the, the bean curd or the, the tofu is very, very neutral, if you will, even a little bland. So you want to have some really loud toppings on there. Goes right on there. The camera catches perfect. And then for the for the uh, uh, savory one, I like to have some coarsely cut cilantro on it. Again, I understand cilantro is a very pol oops, very polarizing herb. People either love it or hate it. And it's important when you have the cilantro to not thank you to not chop it too fine because it smells very grassy after a while. You want to really cut it coarsely. And just some cucumbers. Some just simple diced cucumbers for texture. This one is commonly kept plain. Now, if you want to fortify this, diced apples, some citrus in there, the sky's your limit. I leave that plain for now. Does the camera catch both? And then, so what we have here, one of these fried crullers that go on here. And this will be a very, very typical Chinese breakfast. Southern part would be a very sweet topping. Northern part will be a savory topping, as you like it. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Did I hit the zero mark on the clock? Yeah, Holy I crap. You're good. You got it. Good timing. So well timed. We, ha we do have a few minutes for... For questions for Chef Von Bargain, anything come to mind for anyone? Yes, sir. Chef, you said to do it individually, you have to measure it separately. You have a little bit of time if you mix it in bulk and then separate it into No, no. Once it's mixed, the coagulation starts. So you, I've tried that. I, it doesn't work at all. You've seen in the, mo the moment you have just a little agitation. It is, of course, possible. It is, of course, possible. You can, you can measure this then by volume. So, okay, you, you figure out which bowl you have, and you said, okay, I need a quarter teaspoon of that. Makes it faster. Put the gypsum on there. Have a squirt bottle of water. Have the the hot held soy milk somewhere. Goes on there, and then then let it sit. Or you have it. You you uh, make it ahead of time and put the cold soy milk on there, and then steam them and serve it from the steamer. So in an, I can really see this on an on-campus dining situation. Students from China, them, they're going to love you to pieces for that. So it is, it is, it is possible to do this individually. It, just, it's, it takes some logistical thinking. That's the thing. Very good question. Other questions? I have tried almond milk, yes. And not really. I haven't. I haven't tried. I haven't tried oat milk yet. There's many, many good things with oat milk. And I have to say, when I tried the ice cream today, that was nice. The oat milk <laughs> ice cream. I really enjoyed that. That was good. Um, but might be worth a check. I just don't know how the gypsum, how the gypsum interacts with the proteins in the oats. Or so on almond milk, I didn't like. It was a very weird texture. So I, I stuck with the with the soy milk. So, but again, if you, another really good thing you can do with this is, and that might be easier for your station to have like a, a, it's a, it's a Taiwanese style breakfast where you put all kinds of aromatics into a bowl, which includes then vinegar, about 3% relative to the soy milk. So the, the gypsum was 0.6%, vinegar about 3 to 4%, and pour the hot soy milk on there, and that curdles right there as it gets mixed in, and that gives it this egg drop soup flavor. And this is one of my favorite breakfasts. So it's, it's significantly easier, this one, this one. You, you, can, you can prep the bowl the night before. And what commonly goes in there, it goes in there is the ginger, white pepper, this chili paste I mentioned here, the Laganma La brand, dried shrimp, scallions, cilantro, perhaps some salted vegetables, very, very common, like salted radish in Chinese cuisine. And you can have all these things prepped ahead of time, hot hold the soy milk, pour it on there, bam. Together with one of these crawlers, phenomenal breakfast. It's just mainland Chinese often don't know it. It's a typical Taiwanese thing. Very good. Other questions? Chef, I'm curious if you can comment just broadly about where you see the plant forward movement right now, where you think it's going, given your international travel experience, given your 
teaching experience to so many different audiences. Yeah. And now most recently with, with students, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like where do you see this all right now and where is it going? There's the hope I have, it goes on. The hope I have, I cannot, I cannot say enough how much I appreciate the plan forward cuisine. So my hope is it goes on. I just foresee it a huge piece of work because many cultures, while I'm from in Germany, it's very meat and potato. Even though we have times and, and, and like a season, seasonal vegetable, think white asparagus. Anybody been to Germany had white asparagus? And the time from May to June, Germans get nuts about white asparagus and all of a sudden the meat is secondary. So once I explained this to them, I said, oh yeah, oh yeah, it makes sense, you're right. Yeah, so that's because for them meat is so centric. I just recently talked to my dentist. He said, what are you doing, plan forward? Nah. Now, so it, it takes a good amount of work, conference like this, working together with uh, yeah, celebrities to push this, but I do feel the world's going to be a better place when we just not eliminate, but reduce our meat consumption and then have quality instead of quantity. That, I think that's, that's very important, but I do understand it takes a lot more work, so I'd love to come back year after year. We'd love to have you. Please join me in thanking Chef Von Bargain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chef. It's been a pleasure. Amazing. Big hand for Rebecca, trust yes, me. Yes, Chef Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank okay, you. well, that concludes this session. We are going into about a 30-minute break, and, um, and then on the back of your badge, you should have your next session that you're signed up for. So you'd either stay here or go to one of the different room locations. As Chef on Bargain mentioned, he's going to be serving that for breakfast tomorrow morning. So you'll get a chance to, to taste and experience that. Um, and I'd just like to thank again Unilever Food Solutions for sponsoring this session. And thank you all for, for being here today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons. Chef Kim Jong-jin입니다. 오늘 준비해드린 메뉴는 백김치, 그 다음에 그 곤드레 솥밥 두 가지를 준비했는데요. 백김치 같은 경우는 약간 한식의 김치를 그냥 서양 음식의 크린저 같은 역할을 할수 있는 게 무엇일까 고민했을 때 약간 아무것도 첨가되지 않은 그냥 순수한 발효한 맛의 김치를 약간 좀 응용해 보겠다고 해서 만든 김치입니다. 그래서 백김치를 만들고 백김치에다가 아 배에다가 백김치를 채워서 만든 음식이라고 생각하시면 편할 겁니다. 근데 특이한 부분은 백김치 그냥 단독으로 사용하는 게 아니라 거기에 이제 들어가는 국물 같은 경우는 동치미를 따로 만들어서 이제 약간의 배즙을 계속 조금씩 조금씩 추가하면서 유기 그 산에 약간 활성화를 시켜서 만드는 국물을 첨가하는 부분이 조금 다르다고 할수 있습니다. 감칠맛을 내기 위해서 뭐 다시마 육수를 쓴다거나 아니면 뭐 설탕이나 그런 거 최대한 자제하고 뭐 양파나 그 다음에 뭐배 같은 걸 써서 감칠맛을 높이는 역할을 조금 함, 합니다. 그리고 대부분 백김치 같은 경우는 그 우리나라 지역적으로 보게 되면 약간 온도의 편차가 있기 때문에 약간 위쪽 지방에서 많이 사용하는 김치긴 한데 양념이 많이 들어가지 않습니다. 약간 밑에 지방으로 내려서 따뜻해지기 때문에 약간 양념이나 뭐 맛들이 조금 자극적이라면 그 지금 서울이나 서울을 중심으로 해서 위쪽으로 갈수록 양념이 적어지는 경향이 있습니다. 그래서 그 재료의 순수한 맛을 발효시켜서 낸다고 보시면 조금 편하게 이해할, 이해가, 이해가 될 겁니다. 음. 곤드레 같은 경우는 이제 뭐그 봄에 나오는 나물 중에 하나이긴 한데요. 봄부터 여름까지 나오는데 예전에 한국 같은 경우는 먹을 게 많지 않았었기 때문에 약간 좀 약간의 국물에다가 나물들을 써서 죽 같은 걸 많이 먹었었는데 정선 쪽에서 그 곤드레가 많이 자랐는데 약간 바람에 흔들리는 모습들이 술 취한 사람이 걸어가는 곤드레 만들이 채서 걸어가는 그런 거랑 비슷하다고 해서 이름이 그렇게 지어졌고 약간 그 나무를 채취를 해서 약간 그 상태로 먹게 되면은 밥에는 다 풀어질 수 있는 부분이 있어서 삶아서 한번 건조를 하고 다시 물에 불려가지고 양념을 해서 
볶아가지고 밥 안에 집어넣고 해서 약간 식감 있게끔 만든 나물밥이라고 생각하시면 편할 겁니다. 특이한 점은 저희는 이제 매일매일 쌀을 도정을 합니다. 그러니까 쌀 같은 경우 도정하고 나면은 이틀 정도가 지나고 나면 약간 향이나 맛에서 약간 조금 그 최상급에서 약간 떨어지기 시작하기 때문에 저희는 이제 예약 인원수에 맞게끔 매일매일 도정을 하는 부분이 조금은 다르다고 할수 있고요. 그 다음에 한 번에 많이 짓는 게 아니라 그 나갈 수 있는 양만큼씩만 따로 소수해서 바로바로 바로 밥을 짓는 것도 약간 조금 차별화된 점이라고 볼수 있습니다. 그리고 곤드레스밥 같은 경우도 뭐 다시마 육수나 아니면 야채 육수, 채소 같은 걸 해서 육수, 밥을 짓고요. 따로 여기서 사용되는 모든 솥밥 같은 경우는 거기에 어울리는 육수를 사용해 항상 밥을 짓고 있습니다. 우리가 만약에 이 식당을 해서 한식을 한다고 했을 때 어떤 흐름으로 갖고 갈 것인가에 대한 고민했을 때 그러면 한식에서 가장 최고는 무엇일까 생각할 때는 예전에 조선 음, 조선 궁중 음식이었던 거예요. 그러니까 왕은 어떤 음식을 먹었을까? 거기서 시작이 됐던 것 같아요. 왕 같은 경우는 아침에 일어나자마자 약을 먹었어요. 탕약을. 그러니까 잠들어 있던 신체를 깨우고 어떤 기혈들을 오픈시켜주는 역할로 해서 모든 영양분이 퍼짐으로써 이제 하루의 시작을 맞이할 수 있게끔 하고 그 다음에 항상 그 수레상만 먹는 게 아니라 뭐 죽상도 먹고 그 다음에 뭐 어떤 면상도 먹고 하면서 가장 마지막 밤에 먹는 부분들은 그냥 그냥 큰 상으로 봤을 때 항상 밥이 중심이 있었어요. 그러니까 나머지 찬들도 많이 있겠지만 결과적으로는 이 찬은 밥을 먹기 위한 부분이었었는데 이유를 보게 되면 아침과 우리가 자기 전까지 에너지 흐름이랑 거의 비슷하더라고 생각을 했었어요. 그래서 어떻게 보면 잠들기 전에 약간 조금 단맛으로서 약간 뭐 약간 릴렉스 할수 있는 그런 부분 이전에 마지막 이제 신체적으로 에너지를 보충하는 역할로서 밥을 사용한다고 보시면 조금 편하실 것 같아요. 약간 아시아권은 채식 위주의 어떤 식사들이 굉장히 많았었기 때문에 굳이 막 채식을 하, 해야 되겠다라는 것보다는 그냥 어떻게 밸런스를 맞출 거에 대한 초점이 훨씬 더 강하지 않을까라는 생각이 들어요. 서양보다는 뭐 육류의 소비량이 많이 늘었다고 하긴 하지만 아직까지 채식을 하는 그 그러니까 약간 같이 먹는 비중이 높기 때문에 음 굳이 막 채식에 대한 이런 부분들이 외국만큼은 아직 막그 불지 않는 부분들이 약간 그런 이유이지 않을까 라는 생각은 갖고 있습니다 많은 사람들이 그 채식을 하게 생각하면 딱 떠오르는 게그 불교 그러니까 종교적인 부분을 또 많이 생각을 할 거라서 약간의 건강을 생각하는 것은 마음의 수양을 위한 음식이라고 생각하는 부분이 조금 더 강할 수도 있다는 라 생각은 저는 개인적으로 갖고 있습니다Making this delicious vegan flatbread with roasted mushroom sausage and red peppers. I'll show you some plant based techniques for building intense umami flavor for this flatbread. We'll start by making the cashew parmesan. In a food processor, add the raw cashews, the nutritional yeast and garlic powder, and some salt. Pulse to your desired consistency, then set this aside. This cashew parmesan is a very simple and versatile topping and can be used on pasta, salads, soups, risotto, tacos, and more. Next, we'll make our plant-based roasted mushroom sausage. I have some roasted mixed mushrooms that are chopped and mixed in with a dairy-free risotto that I've made using Knorr Professional Liquid Concentrated Vegetable Base. It's easiest to work with when the risotto is slightly overcooked and cooled. Pulse in a blender until combined, but not pureed. Pour the blended mushroom and risotto mixture in a separate bowl and mix in the following. Some slightly overcooked wild rice, dried thyme, granulated garlic, fennel seeds, ground black pepper, and salt. Mix these ingredients well. Now we're ready to put the toppings on our pizza. Top the prepared dough with some tomato sauce made with Knorr Professional Liquid Concentrated Base. Add the small balls of roasted mushroom sausage. Add roasted red peppers, followed by sliced shallots and sliced fennel bulb. Transfer the flatbread to a 500 degree oven on a preheated pizza stone and bake for about six to eight minutes. Remove the flatbread from the oven and sprinkle with the cashew parmesan. 
Top the pizza with some arugula tossed in olive oil, salt, and pepper. Cut and serve your flatbread with roasted mushroom sausage and red peppers. Meat lovers and vegans alike will love this flavor-packed pizza.